It's really a, a personal pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Yanofsky to you. Um, I as a, was also originally trained as a plant biologist, and I have to get across to you my own personal effect that Marty's work has had on me as a biologist, just showing how the power of genetics and, and what it can reveal about natural processes. And Marty's work that he's done for uh, quite a few years now, initially on flower development and more recently on fruit development, has, has really had a very deep impact on scientists both in, in plant and animal sciences concerning the concepts of genetic toolkits that are used to build morphologies, organs, tissues of different organisms and how those genetic toolkits are acted upon during the evolutionary process. Now, Marty was actually an undergrad at UC San Diego, and so he's, he's one of our proud alums. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we've hit him up recently for a donation, but I should probably remember to do that at the end of the talk. <laughs> Thank you. He, um, he pursued his PhD studies at the University of Washington, um, up the coast from here, but really began his career in plant biology with a, a very famous stint as a, as a postdoctoral scientist at Caltech. And he's been with us on the faculty. He's uh, both professor and chair of the section of cellular and developmental biology. He's been with us at UC San Diego since 1990. As with all of the speakers in this series, Marty has been validated and recognized by many outside organizations. He's received a Beckman Young Investigator Award, an incredibly prestigious award. He's been elected a fellow of the um, American Academy of Sciences. And he has um, received a number of teaching awards that really are given to a, just the very few faculty at UC San Diego who are considered to be the very best teachers. So he's very well respected for both his research and for his teaching abilities, and I think that makes it very lucky that we have him as our lecturer tonight. As I said, his, his work builds upon a theme that you would have heard a few weeks ago if you were here during Professor McGuinness's talk. Professor McGuinness, a few weeks ago, told us about genetic toolkits, a particular toolkit called the homeobox genes, initially characterized in Drosophila as being responsible for the formation of different appendages of the organism. And along with those genes come mutations in those genes called homeotic mutations when, for example, an antenna in a fly gets turned into a leg coming out of a fly's head. What Marty's work has done over the last 20 years is to look at similar homeotic transformations but in the plant kingdom. And using a, a tiny little weed, a relative of the mustard plant called Arabidopsis, something we refer to as a model plant or a reference plant, Marty really uh, astounded the world of biology by revealing those genes, those same genetic toolkit that are responsible for flower formation. So I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Professor Yanofsky, who's going to be telling us about unraveling the mysteries of flower formation. Well, Dave mentioned uh, just a moment ago about the emergency exits on both sides, and this might be an excellent time to make use of those. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Steve for that uh, very nice and kind introduction and long introduction. I think I probably should have just given you the slides and let you give the talk for me. Uh, but I'd also like to thank all of you for coming out on this uh, wonderful evening and hearing me talk about one of my favorite subjects, 
namely how flowers develop. And I should say at the outset that the, the studies on flower development are probably, um, more labs work on flower development perhaps than almost any other subject in plants. And so studies are going on around the world in many, many laboratories. And tonight, because of time constraints, I'm going to focus really on the contributions of just two labs, my own lab here at UCSD and the lab of Elliot Marowitz, a wonderful lab at Caltech up in Pasadena. Now I think we can all appreciate the beautiful flower and uh, flowers have uh, different organs that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the beautiful petals shown in this flower here that come in many different shapes and sizes and colors as well as the different reproductive organs shown in the middle, the stamens uh, with the pollen-bearing anthers and the carpels in the middle. Might these flower organs be derived from leaves as some researchers have suggested over centuries. I'd like to begin by just giving a brief and very brief overview or history of the evolution of plants and talk about how it is that flowering plants emerged, which is much more recent than some of the more ancient ones. So some of the first plants were the green algae that were around for a long time before finally plants decided to move on to land almost 500 million years ago. And some of these land plants included the mosses that you're probably familiar with. And from these land plants evolved the first uh, so-called vascular plants, which included plants such as these ferns several hundred million years ago. And eventually the first seed plants emerged. Uh, these seed plants referred to as the gymnosperms, uh, the cone-bearing conifers, for example. And from these uh, gymnosperms, uh, the first angiosperms, or flowering plants, emerged. And it's estimated to be about 140 million years ago that the first flowering plants emerged. Now, even though it's a relatively recent uh, time evolutionarily, the emergence, the emergence of the flowering plants, they now dominate the landscape. So the majority of plants out there are flowering plants, or angiosperms. Now, of course, it's impossible to give a talk in this lecture series without mentioning Darwin, and, and we're all familiar with Darwin's contributions to evolutionary theory. Uh, but what I want to focus on is his contributions to plant biology and one particular observation that he wrote about uh, back in 1879. And he referred to the origin of flowering plants as the abominable mystery. Where do they come from? Just suddenly in the fossil record, the, the angiosperms or the flowering plants emerged and just as suddenly they diversified so that, as I mentioned, they now dominate the landscape today. So Darwin thought about this a great deal. He posed this question, and the question remains largely unanswered today, although many clues have uh, come to light in recent years. Now Darwin, of course, wasn't the first to think about this question and the question of flowers. Um, and a uh, famous writer and poet, Goethe, wrote a, back in 1790 a number of very interesting observations about plants. And he knew a great deal about plants by collecting different species, and he came up with a number of theories, uh, some wild theories that proved to be incorrect, and, and some uh, wild theories that proved to be correct. And, and I think wild in the sense that it's remarkable that back in 1790 he could come up with these ideas that we are only now showing to be true. And one of these ideas is illustrated here. Uh, Goethe said that he believed that the different flower organs, namely the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels that I will talk about today, all of these organs are somehow just modified leaves. So if we look at this diagram here, we see a normal leaf, and then we think of the flower as shown in the right here, uh, that consists of each of these different organs, the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. And perhaps it's not that difficult to imagine that this leaf could be modified to form uh, a sepal. The sepals are green and leaf-like anyway, but it's a little harder to envision how that leaf might be modified to form these petals, although the petals do have more or less the cell morphology and shape of the leaves, um, and they're, they differ in shape and size and color, of course. But it's even more difficult to imagine how the reproductive organs, the stamens with the pollen-bearing anthers and the carpels uh, with the eggs or ovules inside, how they may have been derived from leaves. Uh, so really it's quite interesting to think that Goethe back then, even in 1790, had this idea that as I will show you today, we now understand to be true. 
Even Goethe was not the first one to think about flowers and how they might develop. Uh, in fact, uh, people have pondered these questions for many centuries, uh, and some of the oldest recorded evidence of this uh, was even before 286 BC by Theophrastus. And Theophrastus described the flowers that I show here, these double roses. Uh, and he referred to these roses as monstrous flowers. Um, normal roses only have five petals, and these monstrous roses had many, many extra petals. Now today we, we know of this particular characteristic quite commonly as uh, double flowers, and I'll be talking about the mechanism that leads to these double flowers in a moment. But Theophrastus uh, wondered how it was that these monstrous flowers might have arisen. Now over the centuries that followed Theophrastus, uh, many, many monstrous flowers or double flowers were recognized and are known in the literature. Uh, I've shown a picture here of these double peonies or, or monstrous peonies flowers. And you can see the characteristic of these flowers is that they have many, many, many petals. And of course the petals typically are the attractive or pigmented part of the flower, and so uh, many people uh, wanted to save these uh, abnormalities. Uh, and you could probably also imagine that because these petals form at the expense of the reproductive organs, in other words, the stamens and carpels that normally form in a flower don't form in these double flowers, uh, because of that, these, these plants normally wouldn't be able to survive in nature. So uh, botanists or people in the garden who discovered these uh, would simply propagate these via cuttings. Now, what I'd like to do is just uh, use this slide to introduce the subject of today, namely how it is that genes control the development of both plants and animals. And of course, today I'll be talking only about the plant, but I wanted to uh, just use this slide to illustrate the fact that there are very similar underlying mechanisms involved. And for those of you who were here just a few weeks ago to hear Professor Bill McGinnis, you heard about the homeotic mutants and homeotic genes and how these genes pattern uh, the animal organism. And in fact, that's a very important discovery, the homeotic mutants, uh, and, and that work led to um, a number of observations that were recognized several years ago with the Nobel Prize. Obviously very, very important work. Now in the plant, uh, there are similar homeotic mutants and correspondingly homeotic genes, and it's these genes that I'll be focusing on today, namely the genes that pattern the different organs of the flower. This is my favorite plant. Um, and hopefully, uh, one thing you'll take home from today, if you haven't already learned about this, is this plant, Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is simply um, a plant in the mustard family. It's really a weed, as Steve mentioned. Um, but it's closely related to plants you're familiar with. And in fact, I noticed driving along the uh, Highway 5 on the way here, uh, we passed along the hillsides with many of these yellow mustard flowers that are very closely related to Arabidopsis. Many other plants that you are familiar with are very closely related to Arabidopsis as well, and these include some crop plants, such as cauliflower here, or cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli, and many others. And so one of the important things that I wanted to mention is that because Arabidopsis, shown here on the right, is so similar to these crop plants, in fact the genes are virtually identical, uh, what it means is that any discoveries that we make in this model plant, Arabidopsis, can very rapidly be assimilated or transferred into these crop plants. And for example, let's say we discovered a gene that might make the seed three times larger than normal, and if for some reason we wanted to do that in one of these crop plants, we could easily do that. So I wanted to just say a few things about why it is that Arabidopsis is so important. And the main reason it, that it is so important is that it, it has been adopted as a model organism. Uh, up until about 20 years ago, before plant biologists um, adopted Arabidopsis, botanists or plant biologists were working on their favorite plant. In fact, there were hundreds and hundreds of plants that people were working on. And it was hard to make the kind of progress that we've been able to make in the last two decades because Arabidopsis was selected as a model organism. Now that's the same in animals, um, uh, when animals adopted the fruit fly, or for example in, in prokaryotes with bacteria, when people used E. coli as a model organism. The advantage is you have laboratories all over the world developing the tools that you need that will allow for rapid discoveries to be made. So I think that's the, the, one of the great advantages of Arabidopsis uh, is that many, many laboratories, in fact nearly every laboratory working on plants around the world takes advantage of Arabidopsis. Even labs that work, for example, on corn or rice, they use Arabidopsis as a rapid gene discovery tool. Uh, 
They identify genes in Arabidops Arabidopsis, and then they go into rice or corn or wheat or whatever their favorite plant might be. Um, and in the agricultural biotechnology companies, similarly, they were exploiting, exploiting Arabidopsis as a tool for gene discovery. Now, one of the reasons why it was adopted as a model plant is because it has a very short life cycle. We can go from one generation to the next, from seed to seed to seed, uh, in about six weeks. Uh, and if we're working with another plant, such as corn, you can maybe get two or three generations a year, but things are a lot slower. And of course, if you're working with a model tree species that only flowers after 10 or 20 years, you can imagine how long it might take to go 10 or 20 generations. Another thing is that it, it occupies very, very little space. So in a laboratory, we can grow literally millions of Arabidopsis plants in a, a small room, and all we need is a small room with, is, with some lights. Uh, whereas if you're working with most other plant species, you need large greenhouses or acres and acres of land. And one of the exciting features is that the genome sequence is known. The DNA sequence was determined, and that was the first plant species for which the genome sequence was determined back in the year 2000, not very long ago. And I have to say that the work to uh, determine the genome sequence involved many laboratories, an international effort, over well over a decade. So it's a lot of work that led up to that only about seven years ago. And now we can sequence the Arabidopsis genome overnight. So the technology is very rapidly advancing. I also want to mention the ease of genetic transformation because this is another aspect that makes Arabidopsis amazingly potent for genetic studies and for what we call transgenic or genetic engineering studies. We can probably transform Arabidopsis or genetically engineer it, and I'll give you some examples in a few minutes, about a thousand times easier or faster than any other plant. Probably about 10,000 times better than a plant like corn, for example. So it's a huge asset because any time you isolate a gene and you want to study it, you want to manipulate it in the test tube, and then you want to put that gene back in and see what happens. Well, that's really easy in Arabidopsis, and it's very difficult in almost all other plant species. It's doable in many plant species, but it's really easy in Arabidopsis. All right, that's my sales pitch for Arabidopsis. Anybody buying? What I'd like to do is just use this one slide, because I know not everybody here is a geneticist, and just mention uh, something about the power of genetics and how it is that uh, geneticists use uh, mutants to infer gene function. So as I'll be telling you in just a few minutes, um, flowers come from stem cells. So uh, I'll show you some slides in just a minute, but there's a group of stem cells at the top of the plant that gives rise to a flower. And uh, normally that happens, and we have a gene here just labeled gene X, I'm just giving an arbitrary name, that's necessary for that to happen. Basically, the stem cells uh, are instructed to form flowers by gene X. Now, if we mutate gene X, if we remove its activity by mutation, this is what happens, okay? Instead of a single flower, we get a massive proliferation of these stem cells, okay? Just by removing one gene, for example. So, uh, this tells us that because when we mutate this gene, we don't get flowers, that tells us that this gene X is necessary for flowers to form. Okay, so it's a very simple thing. We infer function by finding out what happens when that gene is missing. Now, Arabidopsis has about 30,000 different genes, um, and so we really essentially have to look at them one at a time, knocking them out, mutating them one at a time, and there are very sophisticated ways of doing this, uh, to identify all of the genes that are involved in a particular process, for example, in flower development. And then once we have those mutants, uh, then we can really understand how those genes contribute to flower formation. In this case, gene X is a gene um, that was identified a number of years ago. It's a gene called cauliflower. And perhaps that's not surprising because what happens is when you mutate gene X, a cauliflower-like structure forms. In fact, the structure is morphologically identical to the dinner table cauliflower that occurs in a very closely related species. In fact, it was shown that a mutation in that dinner table cauliflower gene uh, is responsible for uh, um, that cauliflower phenotype. In other words, the cauliflower that you know and love and eat, or some of us know and love, um, has a mutation in the very same gene that is mutated in Arabidopsis. So you might think about that next time you're munching on some cauliflower, that you're really munching on some mutant stem cells. <laughs> 
Nonetheless, we can use this power of genetics to infer gene function, and so a number of laboratories set out uh, a couple of decades ago to identify the major genes that pattern the flower. So this is a picture, in fact, from my own yard. It's a uh, camellia, and it's a monstrous flower. It looks scary, doesn't it? It's a monstrous flower because it has that double flower characteristic, and it, what it really has is the endless, beautiful reiteration of petals. And it forms so many petals in part because the reproductive organs are missing, and each one of the reproductive organs has been converted into a petal instead of the stamen or carpal that would normally form. So these double flowers, and you've, you've probably seen them in, in your, even in your grocery stores these days, but certainly in various nurseries, and they become quite popular. But where do they come from? And is it possible that we can use the power of genetics in Arabidopsis to understand how these double flowers arose and answer some of the questions that people like Theophrastus and Goethe and Darwin uh, hypothesized about many centuries ago. So I want to introduce the beautiful Arabidopsis flower. It's beautiful to me. Uh, and it has four different organ types that you'll become familiar with this evening. On the outside are the green leaf-like organs. There are four of them, and they're called sepals. Interior to the sepals, are the petals, and there are four of them as well, four white petals. Now, the petals, petals are not pigmented, of course, in Arabidopsis, but they are the attractive and pigmented part of, of most uh, flowering plants. Um, the male reproductive organ is called the stamen, and it has the pollen-bearing anther on the top. And then in the center of every flower are the carpels. In Arabidopsis, there are actually two of them that are fused along their entire length, so the eggs or the ovules are contained inside. And you can see this stigmatic tissue on the, tip, on the tips where the pollen adheres to during the fertilization process. Okay, so here's a picture again of the Arabidopsis plant, and I'm going to focus then on the top of that plant, the very top. And this picture then is taken from the top looking down. And I want to point out the fact that uh, one nice thing about Arabidopsis is that a single plant like this has flowers at many, many developmental stages. So you can see on the outside the older flowers. Here's a flower, for example, that's undergoing uh, pollination or fertilization right here. And once fertilization occurs of the ovules inside, a fruit grows out. And of course the fruit is the product of the flower. But if you look inside, you see the younger and progressively younger and younger flowers that are arising at the shoot tip. And it's really at the tip of the plant where all the action is. So I want to zoom in on that shoot tip a little bit and zoom in a little closer and even a little bit closer here, because I want to show you what's happening at the tip, because that really is the secret to these early events in flower development. And we can use a scanning electron microscope to really get a detailed view. And so I want to show you that here. And again, what you're really looking at in this detailed electron micrograph is the tip of the growing plant. So we'll just zero in on that here, and I want to point with this asterisk to the growing tip of the Arabidopsis plant. And this growing tip has a very small number of cells that are called stem cells that give rise to all of the above ground parts of the plant. In fact, there's a fascinating story about the genes that control the formation and maintenance of that growing tip, and I don't have time to talk about that today. Now, as that growing, as the cells in this, uh, as these stem cells divide, they give rise to flower primordia, as we call them. Um, these bulges of cells that will later grow, grow into flowers. And they keep doing that about every 12 hours in Arabidopsis, depending on the growth conditions. And you can see as you work your way further and further down the plant, uh, we see slightly older and older and older flowers. And this just continues to happen throughout the life of the Arabidopsis plant. And so here, you, this number one here is the very youngest flower. It's hard to call that a flower, right? It's just a group of cells that is being pushed away from the uh, stem cells here in the center. And though that tip grows a little bigger and bigger and even larger in this number four flower here. It's only a couple of days old, really, from when it was first born. Now, eventually it gets to this stage, and this is a fascinating stage because at this stage, number nine here, at this stage you can see on the very outside the bulges of cells that are going to later grow into the outer organs, the sepals. But in the center of the flower, the remaining cells here have yet to show any visible signs of change. They all look the same. And yet we know that later on they will give rise to the inner organs, the petals, the stamens, and the carpels. So I want to zero in on that flower for a moment. 
that stage nine flower, and just call that a young flower, or we can call it a flower primordium. Okay, so again, you can see the bulges that will later form the sepals. And what I want to point out, using this kind of dartboard diagram here, is that there are cells in four concentric rings, in the sense that on the outside, uh, there's a ring of cells, we'll call that ring number one, and those cells will later develop into sepals. Now the cells internal to those are in the second ring, and cells in that second ring somehow know that they should form petals. Cells in that third ring know that they should go on to form the stamens, and cells in the center of the flower somehow know that they should go on to form carpels. So I just want to pose this question, how is it that the cells in the center of the flower know that they should form carpels? How do they know? How do the cells on the outside of the flower in that first ring, how do they know that they should go on to form sepals? And one thing I can tell you is that even at this early stage, before they've begun to form those different types of organs, they already know what they're going to be. And the way they know that is by the action of these homeotic genes. These homeotic genes are already getting turned on in different rings of the flower primordium, and they're instructing those cells whether they should develop into the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. How do we know that? Well, we know that through genetics. We know that by the characterization of mutants. And for example, I'll show you a mutant in which just one gene is inactivated, and these cells that would normally go on to form sepals, instead, they misinterpret their information, they misinterpret where they are, and they go on to form carpels. They think they're in the center of the flower, even though they're on the outside. So there are just a few genes that are responsible for instructing these cells as to what organs they should later differentiate into. So here again just illustrates the, um, the four different organs that form. And the model is that explains how these different genes uh, specify the identities of these different organ types is commonly referred to as the ABC model of flower development. So first of all, as I've just mentioned, the flower primordium, which is this dartboard diagram here, uh, is divided into four concentric rings of cells. And I've just outlined those rings, one, two, three, and four. And those four rings define where it is that the different flower organs will later differentiate, will later form. Now, the ABC model gets its name because of the ABC genes that I'll be talking about. The A, B, and C genes are responsible for determining the identities of the different organs, the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. So just those three different gene classes, A, B, and C. And one thing that you'll see at the very beginning is that each of those genes is active in two rings of cells, always two adjacent rings of cells. So let me go through a few examples to illustrate um, how we know this. Okay, so here's that same flower primordium using those sort of dartboard diagram. And you can see that the A gene is active in rings one and two, okay, shown in green here. The B gene, in contrast, is active in rings two and three. So you can see already that the B gene overlaps with A in the second ring, because A is also active there. And the C gene is active in rings three and four. So again, you can see that C is obviously overlapping in terms of its activity with B in, this, in the third ring here, but C alone is active in the fourth ring there. So we can use it, we can sort of take a slice through that diagram and, and illustrate it in this way. Um, again, with A being active in rings one and two, the C gene being active in rings three and four in the center of the flower, and then overlapping with A, we have B in the second ring and B in the third ring, okay? So according to this ABC model, the model suggests that any cells that have only the A activity present, they somehow know that they should go on to form sepals. Any cells that have both the A and the B activity present, they are getting information that tells them, go on and form petals. Any cells that have the activity of both the B and the C genes know that they should go on to form stamens. And cells in the center of the flower are getting information only from the C gene, and so somehow they know that they should go on to form carpels. Okay? So it's a relatively simple model 
And it was based initially on genetic studies, in other words, the characterization of the A, B, and C mutants. And then subsequently, it was tested by isolating the A, B, and C genes and then seeing where they are actually active. And then by doing a number of additional studies, such as transgenic experiments that I'll talk about a little later, um, to directly test this model. So let me go through some of the uh, examples and pictures of these A, B, and C mutants so you can see how this model uh, was derived. So first of all, again, just to summarize the ABC model, A specifies sepals, A plus B petals, B plus C stamens, C carpels. So you remember those cells in that young flower primordium, they're looking at this information and depending on which, which genes are active, they know what they should develop into. Now when the genes were actually isolated and tests were done to see where they are actually active, um, it verified the genetic studies. And this is just a diagram to show what the molecular studies show. Um, the A gene is indeed active in rings one and two. The B gene is active in rings two and three. And the C gene is active in rings three and four. So the genetic data had predicted this. And then the molecular data, when people actually isolated the genes and did the detailed and complex studies to look at the expression pattern, as we call it, looking where the genes are active, um, it verified the genetic data. It was consistent with the genetic data. Okay, so I want to come back to this ABC model for a minute uh, because there's one aspect that is rather confusing perhaps at first, but hopefully will make sense afterwards. And that is, is illustrated by these bars between the A and the C. Well, what do I mean? What, what does this mean? And it turns out that the A and C activities uh, really are antagonistic in a way. Uh, in other words, C, the, C, the C gene here, it doesn't want A to, to come into the third and fourth rings there. And similarly, A, which is present over here, it doesn't want C to come into the first and second rings. So they're kind of like fighting it out with each other. So if I used a diagram to show exactly what I mean by that, again, when the molecular studies were done, it was shown that A, shown in green here, is active in rings one and two, and C is active in rings three and four. So they don't overlap whatsoever. And I've just put this diagram in here to illustrate there's a very sharp boundary then defining where the A gene is active and where the C gene is active. And these bars here indicate this mutual sort of antagonism that they share with one another. But how is it that we know, for example, the C gene is really um, trying not to let A be active in the center of the flower? And how do we know that the A gene over here is trying to prevent the C gene from being active out here in rings one and two? And of course, we know that through molecular and genetic studies. And I'll give you an example or two examples. If we mutate the C gene, what might happen? Well, the genetics as I just told you, would suggest that if we mutate the C gene, A might now expand to include all regions of the flower because C isn't there to keep it out. And that's exactly what happens as shown in this diagram here. So if we have a C mutant, we inactivate the C gene. The A gene, which is normally restricted to rings one and two, now expands to all parts of the flower. So it, isn't, it is indeed the case that the C gene, one of its functions is to prevent A from being active in the center of the flower. Now conversely, the a, uh, in A mutants, the C gene, which is normally active only in the center of the flower, now it expands throughout the flower to include rings one and two, where normally the C gene is normally not active. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So the A and C genes are mutually antagonistic, and this will be uh, important in a minute when I show the mutant phenotypes, as we call them, or characteristics. So I want to remind you first of the normal Arabidopsis flower with the four sepals, the four petals, the six stamens, the male part of the flower, and then the two fused carpels with the stigmatic papillae here on the tips. That's the female organ. So let's take a look first at what happens in an A mutant. Here's the normal flower shown on the left, and here's a diagram of what the genetic model predicts would happen in an A mutant. Now first of all, in A mutant, uh, because we don't have the A gene active anymore, we know because of this so-called mutual antagonism that I just spoke of, C now expands throughout the flower. So that is going to change how cells will respond to that activity. So for example, in the normal situation, sepals form in the first ring because A is the only gene that's active there. But now 
in the A mutant here, C is the only gene that's active there. So what organ do we expect to form in an A mutant? Seem to be paying attention. Yes, carpels. <laughs> exactly. And in the second ring, where petals would normally form, where A and B are present, now we have B and C present. And so the expectation is that those organs will now develop as stamens, right? And so this, this model here illustrates that instead of having sepals and petals in the first two rings, we have carpals and stamens. And that is indeed um, the characteristics that are observed when the A mutant is examined. And I'm just going to just give you one quick uh, example of this. Here is a picture of an A mutant flower. And the sepals that normally form on the outside, here's a sepal here, and here's a sepal here. Well, they're supposed to be sepals, but in fact, in the A mutant, they're developing just like carpels. Both of these organs look like carpels. In fact, you can see they have on the surface these stigmatic papillae that normally form only on the tips of the carpels in the center of the flower. But now you can see the stigmatic papillae forming all over these carpels that are forming in the outer part of the flower where the sepals would normally form. And there are all these uh, ovules, or these ovules really, that are normally inside this ovary chamber of the carpels, but now they're sort of naked ovules that are hanging outside because these different carpal um, carpels haven't fused together. So really there is a transformation of the sepals into carpels in this A mutant flower. So I want to give you an example of the B mutant flower. Now the B mutant is relatively straightforward because of, we don't have to worry about this mutual antagonism. We have A activity in rings 1 and 2 and C activities in rings 3 and 4. So in a normal situation, we have A and B specifying petals in the second ring of the flower, but now we have A alone in a B mutant, so we expect petals to be converted into sepals, right. And then in the third ring where the stamens would normally form because of both B and C, now C alone is present, so we expect stamens to be converted into carpels. Exactly. So this diagram illustrates that. Uh, we have sepals and sepals followed by carpels and carpels. And I just want to give you one uh, quick illustration of that, of an actual flower. It's always hard to see these, uh, these images. You really have to do careful analyses under the microscope and even scanning electron microscopy to really see what's going on. Uh, but you can hopefully notice, first of all, in this bee mutant, the petals and stamens that would normally form never form. And when you look closely, you see that the cells that would normally go on to form petals have been converted into sepals. So we have the normal four sepals followed by another ring of four sepals, um, and we also have the extra carpels. Okay, so the last of these ABC mutants is the C mutant. The C mutant is, is, is my favorite because it's, it's, ver it's very interesting and because, as you'll see, it helps to explain this double flower characteristic that Theophrastus talked about some 2,000 or more years ago. So first of all, just reminding you, the C gene, one of the things that it does is is prevent A from being active in the center of the flower. So this model illustrates the fact that in a C mutant, we expect A to be active everywhere. In fact, it is. And so we can predict in a C mutant, at least the, the model would predict, that the stamens, which are normally specified by B and C activity in the third ring, um, would instead, in, because of A and B being active in the C mutant, we would expect which organs to form there? Petals, right. A and B specifies petals. And that is what happens. Now in the very center of the flower, carpels form because C alone is active there. And therefore, in the center of the flower, we have only A present. So what do we expect to see? Sepals. That would be the sort of normal expectation of sort of a simple genetic model. But it turns out that the C function is a little bit more complicated than that. And that's illustrated on this uh, diagram here. This double flower characteristic that I mentioned is explained by the C gene and the C mutant. So what we see in the C mutant is this characteristic flower within a flower within a flower. In fact, this will continue to go on and on and on. So the C gene is particularly interesting because it's doing a lot of things. First of all, uh, the C gene is necessary for stamens and carpels to form uh, because stamens and carpels never form in a C mutant. So that's one of the things that C does. It's important for stamen and carpal development. Another thing the C gene does, as I've already talked about, is that it sort of antagonizes the A gene. So it prevents A from expanding into the center of the flower, as we see here in the C mutant. 
So that's the second thing that the C gene does. And the third thing, and a very interesting thing that it does, is it tells the flowers normally to stop after producing the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. In other words, after producing the correct number of organs, it says stop. Well, when we don't have the C gene present, it doesn't stop. The cells in the center continue to elaborate new flower organs over and over and over again. So the C gene is particularly interested, interesting because it has these sort of multiple functions. So here's an example of the C mutant flower, or the um, monstrous Arabidopsis flower. First of all, it has the normal four sepals and the normal four petals, but here, as the arrow points to, the six stamens that would normally form have been converted into six perfectly normal appearing petals. And in the center of the flower, where the carpels would normally form, those carpels have been replaced by a new flower, which has the four sepals, followed by the four plus six, or ten petals. And this would go on and on and on if we looked at an older flower. Okay, so now you've learned your ABCs, and now I want to put you to the test to see how well you've been listening. Let's test the genetic model by making double mutes, and that's exactly what was done in Elliot Meyerowitz's lab once the model was first derived. What happens in the BC double mutant? We were inactivating two genes instead of just one, but again, once you know your ABCs, it's very easy to predict what the characteristic flower will be. Here we, again, we see the normal flower. We mutate um, the B and C genes, and the model suggests that A is going to be active everywhere. Everywhere, of course, because C doesn't limit A, so A is active everywhere. And the other thing that we've just kind of learned is because we don't have C, we expect to have this flower within a flower or double flower characteristic. So what organs do we expect to see? Sepals. So the prediction, exactly, is that we have essentially an endless reiteration of sepals, a pretty cool looking flower. And that's exactly what happens. This is a pretty dramatic um, finding, isn't it? And I think that uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that um, the mutations in each of these genes is just one little bit of information. Uh, there are 115 million little bits of information that make up the Arabidopsis genome, and there's one mistake in the B genome, one mistake in the C gene out of those 115 million, and this very dramatic alteration occurs. Okay, so the model was pretty good at predicting the BC mutant. What about the ABC triple mutant? The, the, model's, the model's not so good at predicting that, because you can't really look to the normal situation and say, well, wh where, what happens if we don't have any of these ABC genes? Any guesses? No flowers? Well, yeah. Well, Goethe had an idea about what might happen if we didn't have the ABC genes. And he was around a couple hundred years ago. This is what happens. Obviously, the absence of the C gene gives the flower within a flower characteristic. But it turns out the absence of A, B, and C, all the flower organs develop as leaves. And so here's a picture of that triple mutant. Again, three genes are mutated. And all of a sudden, we have essentially an answer to the question that Goethe speculated, speculated about uh, way back in 1790. So this takes me back to Goethe. You know, he had this idea that each of these different floral organs represents a modified leaf. Uh, you know, how he thought about that, um, you can read about it. It's very interesting, the uh, different uh, theories that he had at the time. Um, and now we can say, we, we can, you know, I wish we was, he was around right now so we could explain to him that he was right, indeed. In fact, the ABC model, the ABC genes explain exactly how it is that leaves uh, are converted into flowers, into flower organs. So again, uh, all flower organs are converted into leaves in the ABC triple mutant. And this allows us to say that the ABC genes are necessary to convert leaves into each of the different flower organs. Now, one experiment that was done after these ones that I just showed you was the one shown here. Now, normally these flower development genes that I've been talking about are only turned on in the flowers. They're normally not turned on in these normal leaves. But as geneticists, we can trick the plant into turning these genes on in leaves. And so this was done in a simple test. We knew A and B 
Those genes are necessary for petals to form. I'm just showing you the ABC model. What if we trick the plant? Instead of having them turned on only in the, uh, in the flowers, what if we turn them on in the leaves? Could we convert those normal leaves into beautiful petals? No. <laughs> it's a simple test of a model, and that's what we do. And, and all this told us is that, well, we knew the A and B were necessary to make petals, but we didn't know that they were sufficient. In other words, we must be missing something. Something was missing. And so around the time that these experiments were being done, another gene was identified, and this gene uh, was referred to as the D gene, or D mutant. And it has a very interesting uh, characteristic in that the D gene, when it's mutated, gives this overall uh, finding. In other words, all the organs develop as leaves. And it probably looks familiar to you because I've just shown you the ABC triple mutant. So just to summarize very quickly then, the D mutant, all of the flower organs, the sepals, petals, and stamens, and carpels, develop as leaves in the D mutant. And this and other studies tell us, this tells us that the D gene is necessary for the activities of A, B, and C. In other words, if we mutate the D gene, then it's like inactivating A, B, and C as well. So we can add D to the model uh, very simply, like this. A and D then specify sepals. A, D, and B specify the petals. D, C, and B, the stamens. And finally, uh, D and C, the carpels in the center of the flower. So now that we have this missing function, is that what was missing when this experiment was done? If we go back and try to trick those plants into um, uh, converting leaves into petals, would it work if we tricked the plants to have the A, B, and D genes active? And the answer turned out to be yes. And this is a, a very young Arabidopsis plant. It's only a few days old. And it starts to grow and produce organs that would normally be leaves, but each one and every one of those leaves turns into a beautiful petal. So now we know we were missing. We have what we were missing. So we can sort of revise that model, call it the ABCD model, A and D sepals, A, B, D, petals, B, C, D, stamens, and C and D specifying carpels. OK, I just want to give you a couple of, uh, of examples before I end about some of the interesting things that we can do, uh, additional things that we can do when we have these genes in hand. Um, so what would happen if we were to um, activate the B gene in all four rings of a flower? So the B is normally active in rings two and three. So here's just a diagram of a model to help you sort of think this through. If we had the B gene active in all four rings of the flower, we could sort of predict what would, might, happen, might happen. And it's shown here. Uh, here. In other words, the sepals, uh, because of A and, B, A and D, uh, would now be converted into petals because of A, B, and D, for example. So we expect this kind of a flower with petals and petals and stamens and stamens instead of the normal flower. So we can make these plants. They're very easy to do. Uh, and that's what results exactly as the model predicted. Instead of sepals on the outside, there are four perfectly normal appearing petals. And instead of carpels in the middle, the two carpels are converted into stamens. Another example, what happens if we activate the C gene in all um, four rings of the flower? The model predicts this again very easily. Now we have all three activity, uh, we, have the, we have the B, C, and D active in all three rings of the flower. Now, because we're activating C everywhere, of course, that's going to turn the A gene off. And that's why A is not listed over here. So when you have B, C, and D, just like you have in a normal flower, B, C, and D specifies stamens. And so we expect to get a rather ugly looking flower, such as this one here, in which all of the organs develop as stamens. So we can trick the plant uh, into producing flowers that have nothing but stamens as their organs. Now, the last example that I want to give you tonight is, is this one. What happens if we activate the A and the B genes in, throughout the flower? Now, we know if we activate A throughout the flower, it's going to turn off C. So the model is shown on the right here indicates that we will have A and B and D throughout the flower. A, B, and D specify petals, right, as illustrated here. We expect the overall characteristic to be a flower that consists of nothing but petals. And because the C gene has been turned off by A, we expect to have the flower within a flower characteristic. So this is a picture of a truly beautiful Arabidopsis flower. It's very tiny, uh, but it has this monstrous flower similar to the flowers described by Theophrastus and uh, throughout the ages. 
of consisting of nothing but beautiful, endless reiterations of petals. So we now know that we can make an Arabidopsis flower produce these uh, beautiful, monstrous uh, flowers. So let me just summarize then by uh, telling you what I've described tonight. First of all, the A, B, C, and D genes specify the four different types of flower organs. The ABCD genes are also sufficient to convert leaves into each of the different flower organs. And I gave you the example of converted leaves into petals. And the one thing that I didn't have time to talk about tonight uh, is that the ABCD model, this model, is generally applicable probably to all flowering plants. And one of the beauty, of, uh, perhaps one of the advantages of working with Arabidopsis, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that it's very easy to rapidly isolate genes. Well, once the genes are isolated in Arabidopsis, it's even more rapid to isolate the counterparts uh, from other flowering plants. In fact, technology allows that to happen within a couple of hours. So now people have isolated the, Arabidops uh, the Arabidopsis equivalents of ABCD from rice and corn and petunia and tomato and, and probably hundreds of different plant species. And so we know that those same genes, these ABCD genes, are present probably in all flowering plants and doing pretty much the same thing in all flowering plants. So that's one of the kind of take-home lessons, is that these genes um, play a critical role in patterning all flowers. So that brings us back to where I started with these monstrous flowers. We can now probably take any flowering plant that you might be interested in, and by manipulating the activities to just a couple of genes, we can make them look like this, have endless reiterations of petals. And if you want to make wilder looking flowers, we can pretty much put any organ in any place. So again, what I'd like to do uh, is just acknowledge the many people in my own laboratory at UCSD that contributed to the flower development work that I talked about tonight, and particularly want to acknowledge Elliot Marowitz and the members of his laboratory um, that have contributed uh, over the years. In fact, that's where I did my postdoctoral training uh, some 20 years ago. Thank you very much. The question is, how do the monstrous flowers, such as the one shown here, reproduce without reproductive organs? And the answer is they don't. So the way we need to propagate these uh, is through vegetative propagation, by cuttings. Now, it's, you know, if you're a geneticist, uh, there are more complicated ways uh, of dealing with this, and that has to do with uh, the fact that we have two copies, plants have two copies of every gene. And so um, if you're familiar with genetics, and maybe this is something I can talk about later, um, by having one good copy and one bad copy, um, what we call a heterozygote, it is possible to propagate uh, these even um, sexually through um, using the stamens and carpels. Okay, th those are both good questions. The first question has to do with the types of flowers that have bracts subtending the flowers. Now the ABC model, ABCD model, will be applicable to the flower part of, of all of those flowers, so all flowering plants. Uh, and to the bract part is something different. Basically, it's a leaf-like organ that subtends the flower. But if you look at the flower part of the euphorbia or whatever poinsettia or whatever you're, you're dealing with, uh, this, that would fall under the same general principles of the ABCD genes that I talked about. Now, your other question is one that hasn't been fully explored, although it's been looked at a great deal, and that has to do with where did these genes come from, the ABCD genes? Did they all arise at the same time in evolution, um, or did some arise sooner and some arise later? Now, there have been many, many studies that have shown that these genes are present in all flowering plants. Some of the genes were present in plants before the flowering plants, such so as the gymnosperms. Uh, and um, so, there, there has been a lot of work there, but unfortunately not a lot of sort of genetics to sort of study the functions of those genes. So we know that they were present in some of these ancestral plant species, but it's been a little more difficult to get at the functions because uh, those species are a little more difficult to do genetics for. So um, those are really uh, the types of questions that I think will be uh, explored over the next uh, maybe 10 or 20 years as some of these difficult genetic systems are um, untangled. The question is, uh, where, do, where does the genetic material reside in the plant, and what do all the other genes that are not the ABCD genes do? Um, in an Arabidopsis plant, there are about 30,000 different genes, as I mentioned, um, and a fraction of those, maybe a few hundred or more, are involved in different aspects of flower development, probably even more than that. But of course, there are many hundreds that are involved in, in root development or in stem development, leaf development, uh, and carrying out basic processes within the cell. So every single cell of the plant has the same genes, all 30,000 genes. Every cell has them. 
but those genes are only turned on or off when and where they are needed. I believe the question is, how do you um, knock out or mutate a gene? Is that what you're asking? And, and there are many, many different ways uh, the geneticists do this. Um, the, the simplest way is to take seeds of Arabidopsis and soak them in a chemical that induces changes in the DNA. We just soak them, thousands and thousands of seeds that way. We grow them out, and they will randomly induce mutations, and then we just look for abnormal flowers, for example. So that's the most common way. There are many other tricks that we use as well. Well, it's a very good question. The relationship between insects and flowering plants is what you're asking, and how that might connect with the origin of flowers and, and some of these genes that I've been talking about. Um, and the truth is, we don't really have a good handle on that yet, although clearly flowers uh, evolved these beautiful petals, for example, and other structures to attract insect pollinators. So there's a lot of interest in studying the relationship uh, between plants and animals, and a lot of research ongoing, but no real detailed connections really between uh, those insect pollinators and sort of the evolution of these different genes has yet been done. So a lot of interesting work yet to be done. The question is, what, what normally prevents the B gene from being active in the other rings? In other words, why is it restricted to rings two and three? Um, that's a good question, and so very briefly, there are other genes that do that. And for example, uh, there's a gene called Superman in the fourth ring, um, in a sort of simple way of explaining it. A Superman gets his name because when you mutate that Superman gene, the, um, the stamens that form in the third ring now extend into the fourth ring and take over the carpels in the fourth ring. So the carpels are converted into the male organs, hence the name Superman. So there's another gene that I didn't even talk about. In fact, there are many genes that I didn't talk about that come into play that are involved in turning on and off each of these genes. So as I mentioned, I sort of focused the story because there's a wealth of information out there. Um, I'd just like to ask you to not forget to fill out your questionnaires. That's, that's very important for us. And uh, also to join me in thanking uh, Professor Yanofsky for a really wonderful lesson on our ABC and Ds. And please feel free to come up and ask him if you have additional questions. Thanks again, Marty. Thank you.